meetings we are conducting in collaboration with the colleges. So this time we are conducting the monthly clinical meeting with the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology. And the topics will be related to cardiology this time. And uh, the format that is followed is we have two presentations, uh, each one with a presentation and then the interactive case discussion. The first presentation is on atrial week so much, and uh, the session will be conducted by Dr. Ajantan Sivalingam, who is a senior registrar cardiology from NHS in Colombo. He'll be starting the session with his presentation and then followed by the case discussion. And uh, this monthly clinical meeting will be webcast through Zoom. That is also a kind of cannot attend, you also cannot attend in person. So we'll start the session now with uh, Dr. Ajantan's presentation. So at that time, like uh, being the young of the uh, I did but I put in my capacity to come to test like RBS, electrolytes and so on to find the cause for this and get the PC tests and all that. Uh, only have if I had known that uh, a little more about the so much at that time, the cause of the events could have been. So this is a small presentation of, uh, about the area of so mass. Hopefully that uh, we can get some ideas about the so mass by the end of the presentation. So we will be talking basically about uh, what is it, pacification symptoms and uh, whatever pertains to myxoma So it is uh, termed as a benign tumor of the heart. So when you say myxoma, it's something pertaining to myxoid. Myxoid is something translated as mucinous or mucus related in English. So myxoma is a Latin word. So the appearance, of course, uh, resembles mucus in the early days, so they term it as myxoma, because it's probably. And the gelatinous smooth could have the data surfaces, or it could come in varying colors like white, yellow, or brown. And the uh, common side is uh, the fossa oil. And there are reports that uh, these myxomas could be just more than a benign tumor to produce growth factors and the so This is uh, just a simple picture of representing the name probably that the myxoma, mucinous. Uh, in the right mass, that's it. Uh, and the common place is uh, mostly on the left side. So since our case is more oriented towards the right side, I thought of incorporating this picture right into the presentation. So this shows us exactly the, the right side the symptom So just to keep us uh, attached to the uh, presentation some facts about the uh, myxoma. So, 50 percent of primary cardiac tumors. Uh, this is uh, not only about myxoma, common facts about the cardiac tumor, I should say. So, 90 percent solitary and very inflated. So, most of the myxomas, if you take, they are in the left atrium. Uh, 75 percent in females. So, I really don't know how to explain that, but uh, no proper explanation so far. And 10% familiar, there are certain syndromes associated with familiar myxoma and tumor. 5% recurrence in non familiar cases, 25% recurrence in familiar cases. Even after uh, uh, removal of the myxoma, 25% can recur in the familiar cases. Uncommon recurrences after four years of excision, so but depending on uh, uh, the advice we normally we stop following them after four years. Uh, GMA embolism chances are 40%, quite high. Embolism chances are quite high. Um, so, differences between the sporadic and the familiar uh, myxoma. Sporadic ones are mostly tend to be solitary, more common, like 80%, uh, 90% are sporadic cases, usually located in the left area, arises from the space that we are talking about. May also occur in the ventricles or multiple locations. Um, Familiar cases are more in young individuals, often multiple locations, less common. Autosomal dominant, associated with certain other symptoms, we will talk along uh, the way. And recurrent after surgery is uh, common in the familiar. Uh, 
and uh, talking about other tumors of the heart. Basically, we can classify it as uh, primary tumors or secondary tumors, primary being lymphoma, the most common, and other primary tumors are being fine from malignant angioma. And malignant tumors, like since they arise from the muscle tumors, muscle secondary tissue, so we tend to name them as sarcoma, rectomyosarcoma, sarcoma, and uh, lymphosarcoma, for example. And secondary tumors, it can arise from other places. Most important uh, thing being, if you are talking about the right atrial lymphoma, then we have to expose the renal cell carcinomas, infiltrating the IDC. <clears throat> and the symptoms wise, different people have different symptoms, of course, like uh, that is the beauty of medicine, I suppose. Uh, for example, the friend I was talking about was a doctor, he was talking about uh, giddiness. Basically, I was going through this uh, giddiness, it's somewhere around giddiness, symptom giddiness, it's around 20%. So, if you take the most common symptom, it's 75% uh, dyspnea on insertion, perhaps human dyspnea. And these are like uh, generalized features like fever, weight loss. Uh, some rashes also can be uh, accompanied by the myxoma or other tumors, but uh, those tend to not to be the primary presenting complaint most of the time. But when the patient comes, cardiac related complaints, look out for this young session, especially on a young patient. And uh, more 20% is an incident finding. The patient walks through your door for something else, uh, you do a test and you find out. There's something wrong with the ECG, or to, at the next step we go for an echo, you find out that mix of my echo. Uh, like we talk, other features are 50 percent transmission of symptoms are there, but very difficult to pin down these symptoms to mix of my in the early phase. Uh, and 20 percent dizziness and syncope. So when the mix of mass are larger and occupy more space, then you tend to get uh, left heart failures or right heart failure symptoms, or when you embolize. We can tend to get the related symptoms, a stroke or a you know, shortness of breath leading to pulmonary emergency. So, examination wise, if it is on the right side, it is JVP, permanent area, loud S1, uh, forcing on the left side, delay the mitral valve closer, loud P2, pulmonary hypertension, tumor plus. So, what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to be very imaginative, but most of the time, so it's very difficult to find these things and call it a mixoma without looking at the mixoma on an echo or uh, other imagining, uh, imagining what it is. Uh, three basic symptoms has been associated with uh, cardiac tumor, especially mixomas, Carnet syndrome, name syndrome, in name is syndrome, and land syndrome. Uh, Carnet syndrome, the mixoma in breast, skin, thyroid, and uh, the endocrine organs can be also associated like the serenal glands. Entity, endocrine hyperactivity, pushing syndrome, multiple cerebral diseases, aneurysm. So you have to be extra vigilant. Like if you find a myxoma, probably then you tend to screen for this. It's very rare that you find the other things and you screen for a myxoma. So, panic of sex is also somewhat dominant, mutation in uh, certain genes, uh, and the land syndrome is dental genes, tax skin pigmentation, atrial myxomas, blue navy. And the uh, name, the main name is maybe uh, atrial myxoma, myxoid, neurofibroma, the likes. Uh, we need to keep them in mind, but uh, have an idea that we have some endocrinological associations as well uh, with the myxomas and skin associations as well. That's the question with the generalized manifestations. The complications might include congestive heart failure, patent death, if it is implied, pulmonary embolism, or can cause. Uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, infections, and rupture and embolization. So, you words about rupture and embolization, uh, I thought it was, in, it was uh, quite fascinating because uh, the person we are going to talk about has such a presentation on admission. Pulmonary system, right sided myxoma, cerebral left sided myxoma, most common cases, but you can rupture, the small ones can rupture and go into the pulmonary axial or ventilator. Approve the valves as well. So, diagnosis basically it's, it's not rocket science, diagnosis later with so much. You do a, the most important, our training goes into how to suspect the nature of myxoma. And if you suspect the nature of myxoma, to exclude a diagnosis of the nature, we deal with So, through the echo, the echo or cardiac MRI, 
uh, produced. Uh, this is a uh, uh, diffusion nature of nitroma. This is a The smooth surface. So this, uh, let's see how to differentiate from that. And so this is what they can do for us. All right. This is you see the mixture. Huh? Like when, when the heart is uh, moving, it stays put there because the attachment is put there to stop. So imagine when the attachment goes wrong, uh, probably of an exertion or something uh, bigger, or naturally when the mixoma is close, the bulb grows up, and the attachment goes wrong, it can rupture, and this gets to the imagination where it's going to be lost. Uh, and there's, there's a larger one. You can see that it's popping towards the mitral valve, into the mitral valve, and into the head. This is an uh, other imaging modality. Uh, this is the actual representation of a slide that we got. Probably you could have a better slide with a more advanced cardiac imaging. Uh, this is the agent with some of a patient in the MRI scan. And the differentials are basically intracardiac thrombus, intracardiac masses, other masses like primary or secondary. And of course, you'll have to exclude the renal cell carcinoma. And just to find you, yeah, Replay the slide again so we can have a mask inside. Just think about all these things. And if you want to be really particular about the academic skills, then try to keep these things in your mind. But basically, if it is a tumor, then you, have, if you think about primary or secondary. Exclude secondary, if it is primary, then think about atrial mixoma, which has uh, the most uh, uh, common representation in the LA. And if it is in the RA, you have to think about the other stuff. And, uh, it will be some of probably a common universal representation around the heart. So, with soma or thrombus, most, uh, I should say, most uh, important dilemma for young doctors, uh, especially these kind of cardiologists, with soma or thrombus. Thrombus is mostly posterior, atrium, layered at the And with soma has a stroke, if you can find the stroke, you are in So, mobility. Uh, Depends on whether it's attached to the stock or it is less attached to the stock, depending on the mobility may vary. <coughs> so by looking at it, uh, it's much more clear here, but we can say see a layer that we have here. So this is more likely to be uh, thrombus rather than uh, later mix of mine. You can see it is fully round rather than uh, stock. I can't find the stock. I can't find a place where it is attached to a wall in uh, along the way of page. So histology, uh, lipid cells, embolodin, a mixoid stoma, tumor necrosis, calcification, hemorrhage, thrombus. There's two types of uh, cells named after their shapes, pillow cells and steroid cells. And you can show some uh, pictures of this later. So this is a 57-year-old gentleman who came to us uh, seriously on screen for the half of the part of food from our was a retired carpenter actually. He couldn't work recently lately because he uh, came to us actually with a chest pain for one day duration, radiating to the neck. He said he was having this uh, throbbing, feeling the neck, no radiation to the arms, but associated with bursting of uh, shortness of the bursting symptoms some exertion. Uh, <coughs> in more closer uh, questioning about his symptoms, we found out that this has been going on for a while, but the neck pain came on recently and the more pronounced. Shortness of breath came on recent. Shortness of breath on exertion for three years, actually, here, so that he had to stop working. Uh, and worsening symptoms of the last four months, uh, plus three to four symptoms daily. Examination average to this man on admission, so not very uh, mild, peripheral, very mild, low limbs, so expatriate from 18 marginal on the higher side, lung sacrifice, abdominal sacrifice, abdominal sacrifice, no pain to it. Uh, Investigation twice didn't find much uh, abnormalities in the drug test of basic investigations. So I thought I can skip that. And uh, the important ones are the first one we thought of when the pressure box into uh, 
So you know, we just then go on easy people and the minor test pain I started with. But it was something we want to do. For five was point six positive. Test test was six. So we tend to we started taking him as a non-estate patient in my opinion. And then we naturally went into the next uh, uh, modality of uh, measuring or the test for the preservation of Part of this to find out why he is having so much of shortness of breath, inappropriate, or not in concordance with the ACG findings of drop five findings. So, ejection fraction was more than 60, large radial mass extending to the right bend. Uh, so it was at 8.5 to 6.5. Wide uh, based attachment at inter edge of center, high probability of embolization. Inferior vena cava free of masses or infiltration, main palm of the arch not dilated, no region was abnormal. So, but the cycling abnormality was one thing they have seen. It's so much or gave a mass, we should call it that now. And the other abnormality was abnormality. normal in the context of the case or abnormality in the context of expectations. There's no renewable motion abnormalities to explain his uh, ischemic changes. So, this is the uh, echo. Uh, the same patient to the uh, left side of the heart, right side of the heart, right atrium, and probably there's an attachment here if you can watch closely, but it's difficult to say. Uh, you can say it's going downwards, probably as the past the valves and going into the, uh, of the right ventricle and occupying the larger space of the right ventricle. So his shortness of breath uh, probably explains. Uh, it's said that it's different after the use. It's another view of the It's around 8.19, 4.7 here. But the actual uh, size of the mechanism was much larger. It was around uh, 10 to uh, 11 to 6 in the mathematical sample. So, CT abnormal can be ran from investigations to exclude other causes. CT abnormal, normal study, no renal matters. Angiogram, so naturally, we saw this angiogram. We want to remove this, we might as exclude the ischemic artery as well. This is going for open heart surgery. Uh, angiogram, normal formalis, again, justifies that uh, it's not an ischemic artery, but we are dealing with Lung function test, no features of restriction, peripheral layout for limitations, not a peripheral layout for limitations, not a, no specifics about lung function, but the uh, lower limb reflect and no evidence of limit. So, this was not the important test that we thought of uh, going to because uh, lung function tests were not very convincing at that time. Uh, and we couldn't explain the top 9.6 with an angiogram findings of uh, stickless angiogram at that time. For the case, fire CCPA mass uh, consistent with features of mixed or not in the right atrium extension to the right ventricle. Here we confirm that with echo. Main pulmonary artery and its branches are within normal limits. Uh, but the problem was filling defect of the left lower pulmonary artery, left lower pulmonary artery, uh, partial luminal narrowing, it's only partial, distal flow is maintained, so it's not a big pulmonary embolism per se. But, uh, I would say the pulmonary embolism was the cause of his shortness of breath because actually the mass occupying the last space, large space, inside the right ventricle probably must have contributed much more than the pulmonary embolism itself for his presentation or his head symptoms. Distal flow is maintained, no evidence of pulmonary infarction. So, with a pulmonary infarction, probably my pulmonary embolism is uh, part of it, so I just uh, say no. So diagnostic considerations in these patients was in the case of just uh, not too old about intercardiac tumor, probably a large myxoma, probably a large myxoma. Uh, so myocardial infarction, possible or not possible, again, what is against it is echo finding itself, it confirms myxoma, and it also doesn't show much of a regional wall abnormalities which can be correlated with this uh, clinical presentation. And of course the angiogram which was Absolutely normal. And the uh, pulmonary embolism is limiting infarction at the presentation. So, the most likely explanation for the troponinine marginally positive would be a pulmonary embolism uh, mimicking the infarction at presentation and the symptoms. So, just uh, I just came across while I was making this slide. 
I just thought I might uh, probably inappropriate, but I just thought I would just drop it in here. Uh, so our work up has been over, then we have deferred the patient to the cardiothoracic unit, and uh, he was there for a long time, so we have been waiting with him for a long time in the ward. Uh, and so we have been doing other stuff uh, while we have been waiting for one of those stuff. We can, I can't read this actually, so we can read it. It's fine. <laughs> we get to read one And uh, we'll, so don't try this at home. Just uh, hold up the questions here. <laughs> so I get in trouble if you try this at home, I suppose. And uh, no water means for that. No water means for that. And I thought this was also important to know that effect. So, 70 feet long. So, finally, our mate was over with the cardiothoracic team. One day they came up and said, we had approval. One day they came up and said, okay, we are prepared to take. So, we stopped all the uh, fantasies and then the cemetery. So, this is the opening of the slide here. And uh, you can see the stalk, the stump, or the stalk here. And this is the excision after the stalk removed from the right. And this is the stoma. Take this up. See the knee. Of the stalk was that has come up here. So that has been compared to the size, but this is a small brownish and uh, yellowish in color. Like and uh, this is the I shot around 10 to 11 centimeters in the long axis and around 5 to 6, 4 to 5 centimeters from the cross section. Just that compression in the finger. So the histology is a, uh, this is the same usage of the same uh, later mix or not. Larger point was uh, basically from us. This is what I was told. I'm not a quite expert, but this is what I was told. To find the thrombus was in the majority of the part where they cut the side slices. And this is the myxoma uh, tissue, apparently, this is the myxoma tissue. And the lighter part is the side of thrombus. This is in the low magnification. And uh, this is the medium magnification. And again, the medium magnification can if you can appreciate the mixoid background of the tumor. Yes, uh, as you suggest, uh, by looking at it, you can say it's mucus or not, but it's supposed to be the mix, uh, mixoid background. Trust me. So, the, and two kinds of special cells, not special for hysteroid itself, is one is genuine cells, one is sterile cells. Sterile, just so much I remember, it's more like a star, star, genuine cells. Pedal shaped cells, uh, two cells in the mucinous or big soil background. Uh, these are cells that, that were investigated <coughs> mixed or not. And that's it for today. Thank you very much. And Dr. Adam Sansurina, same cells and cartilage. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adam, for that uh, very interesting and a very important presentation on a given to compatible very condition a very important condition. So if there are any questions or clarification from the audience, we can give some more time because we have finished on time. This mix, uh, Mr. Bain, uh, I'm Dr. Damo, some cardiologist. This mix is so actually unusually large. In, uh, this is the largest myxoma that I have seen in my career over the last uh, more than maybe 14 years in cardiology. So uh, very large, and fortunately, at this patient, we would because uh, you can imagine that pedunculated mass is normalized in either way and can cause uh, cause severe or massive pulmonary embolism and uh, death. And uh, fortunately, and this patient actually came to uh, a higher order with a typical chest pain of uh, angina, anginal pain that were, they were thinking. And we had for non stable because it is troponin rise. Only after CTPA, we had realized that this is a uh, fine embolism. And then, uh, other thing I just wanted to clarify Adam uh, symptomatology it's easy for a trainee to keep those things in mind. Uh, is if you categorize these symptoms and complications, the first thing is related to the uh, 
constitutional symptoms because this tumor uh, known to produce a lot of leukopenes, especially as far as I read, interleukin six and so. So that's why you get fever, weight loss, uh, and that type of symptoms. And the second thing is uh, embolization. So any part of the body can be embolized. And thirdly, the obstructive symptoms. So those are the main three: constitutional symptoms, and then obstructive symptoms, and then symptoms due to embolization. So it's easy for us to keep it in mind. Just to add on, uh, but otherwise it's an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pritam, sir, for inviting me into the presentation and the education value. Are there any clarification and comments to be made? Any more clarifications? Okay, so, we'll be moving to the next presentation. Before that, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Suranta Pereira, also the table. And uh, it will be on interesting apple corner syndrome. Presentation will be on that topic. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to start up our session. So, yeah, I'm going to uh, bring you all to the other dimension of cardiology. Uh, this is uh, we currently, uh, day to day, in day to day, our clinical uh, exposure, we encounter with patients with sort of acute chronic syndrome. So uh, I thought of uh, basically the more, get a more emphasis uh, on the presentations of the Wilson syndrome, uh, where we can go wrong and uh, how we can tackle those problems, uh, the onset of the symptoms and the of the patient. Uh, we start with uh, just to remind uh, you the second uh, clinical pathology and so sort of, uh, things. Uh, so, what is acute coronary syndrome? It's a clinical presentation of acute coronary syndrome is a problem because it lies, uh, uh, it covers a broader spectrum. Like, uh, patient might be asymptomatic. When you are taking the ECT, patient might be asymptomatic, but patient still having acute coronary syndrome. At the other end, you can have a cardiac arrest. In between cardiac arrest and the <clears throat> asymptomatic, you can have cardiac shock, on gain ischemia, and ischemia induced mitral agitation. In a uh, induced uh, BSD and so on and so forth can happen. And uh, as you all know, the leading symptom in acute coronary syndrome is chest pain. Chest pain is very characteristic uh, because chest pain, uh, when it comes to chest pain, have to be very vigilant on analyzing what is the chest pain is like because uh, not all the chest pains are acute coronary syndrome. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, certain characteristic like uh, constricting, tightening. Uh, pain uh, that is uh, with uh, that is a uh, duration around 10 to 12, 15 minutes time, and there will be radiation, so there will be diaphoresis and symptoms, right? And, uh, and on top of that, there will be some equivalent symptoms, such as uh, patient may be complaining of some jaw pain, neck pain, uh, left side shoulder joint pain, those are important pains. So, each and every time you have to consider about when you come to patient complaining of. Uh, patient is having exertional jaw pain, so it should re uh, ring, uh, ring a bell to you. So I'm, am, I, uh, uh, am I dealing with the patient with a concurrent syndrome? And when you come to the classification broadly, uh, you can see this, uh, as you all know, it's, it's elevation uh, MI, STEMI, and non-STEMI. The newest uh, the, uh, nomenclature would be non-ST segment, elevation ACS. Not like non -stim. And uh, when it comes to pathology, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, our problems are patient, uh, and uh, in time, the atheromatous plaques are being made. And uh, there is a call, uh, it is called stable engine, where you can uh, see the plaque is very stable. And it's in fact uh, going to be a problem if the patient has a, a more demand. Uh, when the patient is having more exertion, uh, the demand of the cardiac muscle is when it comes to more demanding, the patient will be getting symptoms. So, apart from that, uh, the three entities like unstable angina, non stimia, and ST elevation, those are categorized in like a syndrome. So, what happens is uh, in that uh, those three categories, the path is ruptured. Uh, it could be ruptured, it could be fissuring, or it can ulcerate. 
whatever the thing is, uh, there will be a uh, uh, pay to the aggregation events. So whatever is an unstable angina, uh, there will be some element of ischemia, but mind you, there is no element of myocardial fibrosis. Uh, if there's a necrosis, the nomenclature they refer to non -stimi. And if there is a total cutout from the, uh, the plant site, there will be a state division. As I mentioned here, uh, acute coronary syndrome is gravely divided to STEMI and non STEMI, uh, and uh, non ST elevation ACS in the that uh, component. There are two categories non STEMI and unstable engine. So the knowledge pathology is very important because the management totally differs from each and every uh, the aspect. As I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, in terms of stable energy on the block is very stable. The ECG changes um, will not be very obvious, uh, evident. In unstable energy, of course, uh, because of the ischemia, you can have key inversions, as the depressions, and even normal EC changes can be seen in unstable energy. Uh, when it comes to non STEMI, as I mentioned earlier, now the patient is having a uh, rupture as well as. Uh, distal myocardial necrosis, there will be elevated troponins. This is the first time that uh, you get uh, elevated troponins in these uh, all uh, three categories. And at the same time, you can see uh, the inversion, ST segment inversion, and even normal T uh, can be also seen. Obviously, in STEMI patients, uh, there will be totally cut off from the uh, plug and there will be a uh, massive myocardial necrosis beyond that point, and there will be a stay relations. So, uh, diagnosis of uh, myocardial infarction is a cardiomyocyte necrosis in a clinical setting consistent with acute myocardial ischemia. So, as we all know, the diagnostic criteria should have these following things. Uh, with the, the first one is the uh, increase or decrease of cardiac biomarker value about 99 percentile of the upper preference limit. We commonly use troponin 9. Now, the newest trend is uh, high sensor troponin. And with that, uh, one of the following should be there. First one is a uh, clinically symptomatic, uh, suggestive ischemic type of chest pain. And the second one is new ischemic changes in the ECG. The third one is the development of pathological key waves on the ECG. Mind you, the fourth and fifth are newest things uh, starting from 2018 onwards. Those are uh, basically uh, based on the imaging modalities. Like, uh, in, uh, you can see world motion region, world motion abnormalities in the 2 DFO, as well as uh, intracoronary thrombus in coronary angiogram. Those are those fourth and fifth are uh, added to this uh, universal uh, diagnosis since 2018. So, uh, I'm going to uh, run my presentation with some uh, few case scenarios that we have encountered in our daily activities. And uh, this is uh, we got a patient from a hospital, 40 year old male patient who was a very heavy smoker, chain smoking pack, complete of sudden onset, severe ischemic chest pain, and dizziness. Uh, the thing is, now we have to analyze each and every component, chest pain and dizziness. And of course, the uh, patient was in an unstable on admission, pulse rate was 40, and blood pressure was low. But even though uh, lungs were clear, the patient was not in heart failure. So we quickly go ahead with the ECG, and uh, this is the ECG. And uh, I think uh, I thought of uh, doing it at, uh, this as an interacting, interactive session. Someone can uh, give me the complete diagnosis. X rays, boys, that corner. Yes, excellent. Yeah. As you can see, there's a ST elevations in uh, L2, L3, AVF, as well as uh, the ST depressions in V1 to V3. In fact, it goes beyond V1 to V6. That means posterior extension. And uh, there is a complete heart. Okay, as you can see, the PE waves are uh, on their own rhythm, uh, QR is on their own rhythm. So there is AV dissociation. This is again an inferior uh, STEMI with posterior extension and complete heart drop. So, uh, this was uh, so uh, the thing was a uh, patient was having um, a pulse rate of 40. That's because of the uh, this complete heart drop and blood pressure was 80 by 60. Obviously, he was having RV infarction. 
So we uh, give a bolus of uh, normal saline and fit him blood pressure up. That is the first thing we should do. And uh, then, since the patient uh, was received by us, then we have the facility to go ahead with the primary PCA. So we quickly activated our cath lab and uh, we go ahead with the angiogram. As you can see, uh, this is, uh, I mean, not going to be a big problem. This is the catheter that uh, we have engaged the right coronary artery. And we have injecting a contrast medium to the coronary arteries. And you can see they are saying you total cut off. And uh, then what we did was uh, we put on a wire and uh, we have made uh, the vessel open. We made the vessel open. And we dilated uh, the lesion, the calvary lesion. And as you can see, we have achieved the uh, chemistry flow. You can see uh, the lesion that uh, that was the point that the uh, plaque fracture, and there was a total of occlusion from that plaque, and there was a no flow at all on that in the first instance. And now we have opened the vessel. And what we did was uh, we this is the placement of the stent. And the deployment, and we have uh, done some post elevation as well to make it a more position to the vessel. And uh, as you can see, that was the final line chip now. Yeah. Uh, so that is uh, the uh, first case scenario that we encountered with the patient with inferior stemi. So uh, on, it's not the uh, treating the uh, Coronaries, but you have to uh, make sure the patient uh, goes home and stay well uh, for the rest of his life because uh, it has to be uh, managing in two arms like pharmacological and non pharmacological. Arm. So, first, you have to educate the patient, you have to sit with the patient and talk to the patient, and you have to uh, control the risk factors, the smoking behavioral changes, and of course, we will be running some screening tests to diagnose uh, diabetes and then we have to catch a little bit status. And uh, we'll be advised on the consumption of long term medications strictly, uh, especially if they are by um, both the antiplatelets as well as hydrostatins. Now, the current guidelines is to maintain the LDL level less than 55. So, on top of that, patient has to have a good healthy diet as well as regular exercise with cardiac rehabilitation. So this is uh, our second patient. Uh, the patient is a uh, 55 years old female with diabetes for 15 years duration. And uh, she was complaining of burning central uh, uh, burning pain, central burning chest pain. Uh, it's not a typical chest pain, but she was complaining of some burning sensation. She was treated by uh, uh, some uh, general practitioners with some uh, uh, PPIs, uh, assuming patient was having some GRD symptoms, but uh, she presented with the same symptoms. He was, she was similarly stable on admission, and uh, there was obviously diabetic peripheral vascular disease as well. Company was positive. The check and fraction was a bit low, 50 with some regional wall motion, but uh, is uh, considered really all right. This is the ECG. Anyone willing to answer this ECG? The diagnosis of ECG? Okay, this is uh, as you can see now. Uh, obviously, uh, at a glance, you can see there is something, uh, some uh, abnormality is happening in the anterior leaves, V1 to V6. So, I'll explain what is that. You can see this is a, in fact, we call this a biphasic T wave. So, this is a upward reflection of the negative reflection. And it can, you can see in V1 to V3 and deep T inversion from V4 to V6. This is called balance pattern ECG. Right. In fact, this is a valence syndrome. So, uh, what is this valence? Uh, as I mentioned, valence is a deeply inverted or by basic using V2 to V3. This uh, is give rise to a clue of critical left anterior descending lesion. So, uh, by the time the patient uh, getting this ECG, most of the time patient is aged symptomatic. So, uh, that is a bit tricky. That's what I want to emphasize now. Even though patient is asymptomatic by the time you are taking the ECG, if you see uh, this sort of uh, valence pattern ECG, it's, uh, um, uh, it should, you should be alarming. You should be sending the patient immediately to the nearest uh, uh, 
primary or uh, intervention center uh, because uh, it's a uh, very high risk of uh, developing anterior sterilization in mind within the next couple of days to weeks because there is a critical narrowing in the left anterior descending. The pathology uh, behind now, uh, it's like uh, um, there will be some element of uh, necrosis of the anterior myocardium because that's why the patient is having low ejection fraction, like 50 with some mild degree of hypokinesia. Uh, at the same time, there is a spontaneous autolysis, clot lysis, but there's no uh, total occlusion, but there's a spontaneous clot lysis that will establish the flow to the distal muscular region. So because of that, patient is not ended up with a elevation. In fact, these pyrethacic tubules areas because of that. Uh, and the diagnostic criteria is very easy. Uh, deep in order pyrethacic tubules in V1 to V3, and uh, there will be a uh, ST segment, uh, minimal elevation, ST segment elevation less than one millimeter. The most important thing is you know, there should not, uh, not be in Q wave. If it is Q wave, that means you are dealing with old anterior TV. And uh, there should be a good R wave progression and recent history of angina. And most of the patient is pain free by the time you are seeing the ECG. And you can uh, obviously see some cardiac enzymes are elevated. So, Vedant has uh, two types type A and type B. Uh, in fact, uh, my ECG was having uh, the combination of uh, both ECG. In fact, that, that was a, a, a patient we have encountered very recently. In type A, there will be biphasic T inversions from V1 to V3, whereas in type B, there will be T inversion from V1 to V3. It's like symmetrical deep T inversions. So, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, a combination of type A and type B. So, we have gone ahead with the color engine of this patient. As you can see, there's a critical narrowing of the left anterior descending artery. This is the narrowing. I have uh, made a clip, uh, still image because uh, you guys are not uh, trained to make uh, yeah. that uh, type vision. So what we have done is uh, we have put on a stent and this is the final angiogram. So we have established that uh, we have um, uh, revealed that the obstruction and we have prevented anterior uh, that will be happening in time recently. So uh, when we talk about the villains, it is uh, my duty to talk about a Devinter's T inversion, as I said, as because it goes hand in hand like. The Devinter's ECG pattern is the same, uh, but uh, pathology is the same, but uh, this is more critical than the uh, villains. This is a, they call this is like anti resting equivalent that uh, present without obvious ST segment elevations, because uh, the key feature is the ST segment. ST segment depression, as you can see, ST segment depression and tall tentative views. Mind you have to train eyes because in the anterior STEMI also, you can have these uh, hyperacute T waves. Same thing like this hyperacute uh, ST, hyperacute uh, T waves with ST depressions are seen in this Devinter's uh, pattern. There is seen in 2% of acute LAD occlusions. This is also having this diagnostic criteria of uh, the winters. As you can see, uh, V1 to V3, uh, V1 to V6, you can see these uh, ST depressions as well as uh, tall tender T waves in the anterior leads. But uh, most of the time, they, they are, you can't see any ST, obvious ST segment elevations. So long-term treatment is the same. Uh, if you are intervene, if you are going to put a stent, uh, we have to keep the patient, uh, remind uh, the strict uh, adherence to the drug that we will be giving, otherwise the patient will end up with stent thrombosis. Uh, it could be immediately or later on. And sometimes in stent resistances can occur if there's a uh, poor uh, adherence to the uh, poor drug compliance. Or if you not if you if the doctors are unable to control the risk factors adequately, so we have to keep in mind uh, putting a stent is not the end of the story. You have to keep the patient going on and keep the surveillance on and control the risk factors uh, to the standard levels. So my uh, third case is a six-year-old diabetic patient. He's a hypertensive smoker and he was coming to class three exertion dyspnea. Uh, 
BSB he was uh, having a high blood pressure, 180, 90, and troponin was negative. And music contraction is all right, 60 percent, without any significant trace of wall motion abnormalities. So, uh, in fact, uh, this was uh, his uh, second stage of uh, this was the easy of the second stage of uh, treatment test. Then we put the patient on treatment test because there was uh, that is a standard method. We have to strat risk stratify the patient before embarking on the uh, coronary angiogram. And during the second stage, uh, this was the patient's ECG. So, as you can see, there are widespread ST depressions in one. Uh, AVL, B4 to B6, and uh, there's a classic AVRS elevation. As you can see, there's more than one millimeter AVRS elevations uh, in AVR. So this is called AVRS elevation. So what do you mean by uh, ST, AVRS elevation MI? This is, uh, in fact, uh, giving, I mean, uh, giving you the clue of left main, uh, left main coronary occlusion. In fact, you don't need any uh, high fi angiogram stuff to diagnose uh, patients' skin therapy because uh, since I have mentioned now a lot of things can be considered. You can adequately categorize the, the area of necrosis, the problematic uh, vascular therapy. So if you have uh, come across this sort of uh, area elevation, this is unless from otherwise, there's a tight critical left main coronary artery stenosis or in fact, it is just beyond that thing. That we uh, give as a uh, proximal and radiant demand occlusion. So uh, you can differentiate both the things because if the AVR ST, will, uh, ST segment, the AVR, this component, this segment is more than the AVL that favors more towards the left main coronary occlusion. If the AVR ST elevation is bigger in the AVL, that means proximal LED lesion. So whatever it is, uh, you can, uh, uh, the goal standard would be the going go ahead with the angiogram and see. But uh, you can come to a conclusion where the culprit lesion is. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, not, in fact, uh, sometimes you can uh, encounter these patients, not only the left main coronary disease, as I mentioned, it could be proximal radiation, and sometimes strange triple vessel disease patient. So triple vessel disease patient means a uh, patient is uh, like anterior descending, circumflex, uh, right coronary, all are diseased because uh, during the exertion or during the myocardial infarction, some patients might be, uh, come, come up with this avr elevation because the myocardium supply is very, blood supply is very much poor. A yeah, patient is having poor supply from each and every vessel. So because of that, patient will take rise to avr elevation. A lot of patients uh, we have uh, been referred to us uh, during our casualties, uh, especially in the ICU setup, that patient is having avr elevations. And uh, we are starting with the question, is the patient is on uh, anatrop? The patient the answer is yes. Because uh, endomyocardial ischemia also gives rise to same avr ST elevations. So you have to keep in mind that uh, there are several instances that you can get avr ST elevation, not only critical lady vision. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, if the avr ST elevation is more, that means proximal uh, left main, if the avr the ST elevations are more in B1, that is proximal LA region. And uh, in fact, uh, the double patient we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have detected that uh, left main coronary disease uh, while he was doing the TMT. So uh, we have uh, we stopped the TMT because we know that uh, at this moment uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not a very uh, reasonable to go ahead with the uh, further stress examination because patient is having already uh, left main disease. So we go ahead with the coronary angiogram. It's uh, as we expected, uh, this is the left main. So this is the left system that we have engaged uh, the left coronary catheter. And uh, this is the critical left main lesions that patient was having. Another view, same thing. This approximately 90% lesions was there. 
and the rest of the uh, vessel was all right but patient was having this uh, tight uh, left main disease so the management wise uh, why why the, you can send the patient for CABG depending on the risk factors depending on the uh, angiographic findings syntax score and uh, patient's comorbidities and all uh, or else you can go ahead with the stenting uh, then you can put a stent to left main vessel so and uh, long term wise these patient has to be very very strictly monitored uh, like because uh, they are a very they are in very high risk of getting uh, thrombosis because of we have a, if we are going with the t cell left main and uh, regular exercise cardiac rehabilitation as well as dual antibiotics sometimes we prescribe dual antibiotics more than one year for these patients because of the risk of uh, re stenosis so uh, before concluding my uh, presentation i would like to uh, talk about uh, the interesting entity called spontaneous coronary dissection and this is also we yeah, uh, would say uh, uh, rarely we have encountered uh, five five six patients we have encountered over the last uh, two years and uh, this is uh, because uh, uh, patient, uh, there will be a lamina flow in the coronary artery as well as there will be a tearing of the intima and uh, there will be blood stagnate inside that uh, lumen and there will be a false lumen created. This is the two lumen is now totally occluded and there will be a false lumen. So this uh, spontaneous coronary dissection is usually seen in female sex and uh, sometimes they have been associated with fibromuscular dysplasia. Most of the time in pregnant patients and some patients who are on uh, oral contraceptives or HRTs or any uh, hormonal uh, problems. Sometimes uh, mixed clinical tissue disorders. And uh, we have seen patients uh, with coronary dissection, spontaneous coronary dissection with patients with SLD hormonal arthritis, trans like uh, like, uh, like uh, really uh, inflammatory conditions, patients with inflammatory conditions. So the atmosphere will be the same, uh, patient will become a typical chest pain and uh, obvious, obviously you know, uh, in this section they are, uh, it's very rare to get the total occlusion of the coronary arteries but there will be some uh, flow limitation that you rise to myocardial necrosis that you interpret as uh, hydroponics as well as STT changes. The diagnostic gold standard would be the coronary angiogram and recent development of uh, other modalities of uh, imaging model modalities like uh, intravascular ultrasound scan and optic coherence tomography uh, are helpful in diagnosis. So this is uh, one of our patients who we have uh, encountered this patient. In fact, uh, was having teen versions from V1 to V6 without a non-STEMI. And uh, even though patient was not having any obvious risk factor, she was a 30-year-old female patient. And uh, we go ahead with the angiogram and found not have this coronavirus. As you can see, there's a, a like band-like, uh, thread-like. It's like a thread-like uh, appearance in the coronary artery, in my dish, and it's like a spiral artery. Not only this area, there's an, another area also where the patient was having this uh, dissection. Multiple dissections were there. So because of that patient is having chest pain, T inversions, and hydroponies, because uh, it's not a true uh, flow limiting, the distal flow is, is maintained. So because of that patient is not having uh, frank stay elevation MI. So in fact, I have downloaded this from the internet. Uh, uh, we do have a facility of IPERS, but the OCD is not available at the moment. So what uh, this is uh, intravascular ultrasound scan. This is a, is a tiny ultrasound scan thing we are putting into the coronary artery and uh, doing the withdrawal part. We are assessing the uh, and assessing the architecture and the anatomy of the vessel wall. So if you, you can see this is the true lumen and this is the false lumen. This is a true lumen. This is a false lumen. It's eccentric plant like it is a false lumen. Same here. This is uh, that part is the low lumen, and you can see that the other side is the false lumen. So management wise, uh, most of the time, if the patient is having a timid two, timid three flow, that means adequate uh, uh, distal flow to the myocardium, we just tend to 
keep it as uh, much as possible, cons manage conservatively. And if the patient is having unstable, uh, immune is unstable, one can just pain. And of course, if there's no flow at all, or give me one flow, that means very sluggish flow to the distal uh, musculature, we try to intervene with a PCI. Or if the PCI is not uh, favorable, then we go to the CBG. So that brings uh, to the end of my presentation. Questions? Thank you very much uh, for that interesting uh, lecture, Dr. Janka. Uh, and we have yeah, Dinuka, and we have two questions from the live stream. Uh, that is uh, on uh, atrial mixomas. Yeah, the first question is from Santan Manchak. Uh, sir, what could be the reason for T inversion in V1 to V4 in mixoma? And could the inferior peripheral pain defect in lung be due to pulmonary embolism secondary to the mixomas? Yeah, that uh, I'll just answer the second question. Uh, uh, with the Embolism, uh, uh, the partial pulmonary embolism is due to the uh, rupture or breakthrough of the atrial mixoma. Uh, he said that uh, we can find uh, other abnormalities of uh, coronaries to explain the troponin eye rise. Uh, so, mild marginal troponin eye rise would be uh, it's an accepted uh, feature of pulmonary embolism. Uh, so, that could be the reason. And uh, of course, yes. Uh, Answering the first question now, uh, from what I know, is uh, the controls of the atrium and the ventricles are somewhat uh, distorted with the atrial mixoma. If, especially if it is a larger atrial mixoma, the controls and the functioning and the expansion and the relaxation of the atrial balls could be altered in such a way uh, or in a subtle way that uh, certain uh, non specific changes in the T waves could be anticipated, but there are in no way, by, it, it doesn't mean in no way that they are specific for any sort of, any sort of an intracardiac uh, masses. So it's, well, it's not well understood, but uh, mostly we can take it as uh, an abnormality without no much explanations. Uh, especially we can attribute it to the intracardiac masses causing a uh, different uh, uh, dynamics in the heart muscles. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, answer. And the second and the final one by uh, Tinley Doji. Uh, what were the reason, reason that this patient had such a large size of myxoma? Is it the rate of growth or the thrombosis? Uh, the rate of growth is debatable. In uh, most atrial myxomas, the rate of growth, they say there are fast growing uh, atrial myxomas as well as uh, slow growing atrial myxomas. Uh, the rate of growth, uh, some uh, literature says it's around uh, one centimeter every month, whereas uh, other literature says it's around uh, two to three centimeters every year. So with the symptoms of this patient, with uh, increasing symptoms over three years duration, uh, analyzing the symptoms uh, in the absence of pulmonary artery disease and other lung pathologies, we believe that uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was kind of uh, the because it is difficult to attribute to the growth itself because three years is quite a uh, substantial time. And he has been asking about the what, sir, that the growth of is it due to the, uh, the is it the rate of growth of the thrombosis? Uh, Throm yeah, thrombosis. We, we didn't dissect uh, each and every layer of the atrial mixoma. So, therefore, we dissected the large proportion of the dissection was. Thrombus, it was part of the thrombus. So it's very difficult for me to comment on that. It should be a pathologist who goes through each and each, each and every layer of the thrombus, uh, each and every layer of the atrial so much to comment perfectly on that. But the consistency and the, by the look of it, major proportion of it is not thrombus. Unfortunately, we caught up the thrombus in the slides. So I think it should be the true myxoma which has a growing, uh, 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 it was growing for three years, which uh, was major contributed to the, to the symptoms. Okay. Yeah, with that answer, I think we are concluding the question and answer session also. Yeah. Uh, 
so I'd like to thank uh, such the two lecturers, uh, Dr. Ajantan Sivalingam and Dr. Dinu Kalinage for their interesting uh, lectures. And uh, uh, I will uh, request our uh, president of the Sri Lankan Medical Association to uh, hand over the thank you letter to the two lecturers. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Indika, for that kind uh, question. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Stanley Amrasethra, the President of Sri Lanka College of Cardiologists, uh, for the kind help, and uh, the other consultants, representatives, and the listeners for joining this session. And not only to forget uh, the people who joined the live stream nationally and internationally, finally, all the staff members and who made it a success. Thank you very much, and good evening to everybody. As a concluding remark, I would like to thank again all of you and also uh, Dr. Surant Pera, who has been coordinating and organizing the clinical meetings and this is the clinical meeting that we had for a while after the COVID situation, so it's a special event. And another announcement is we will be having the, the videos of the sessions in our YouTube, so once it is edited and ready, we will be informing you so that you can use this as educational material and share with others as well. And uh, with that, we can put it and thank you and have a nice day.